हेलो एवरी वन इन टूडेज लेसन वील बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट जियोलॉजिकल टाइम स्केल दिस इज पार्ट वन सीरीज एंड इन दिस आई बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट वॉट इज जियोलॉजिकल टाइम स्केल वॉट आर द डिफरेंट एप्लीकेशन ऑफ जियोलॉजिकल टाइम स्केल एंड द डिटेल्स अबाउट इट वील स्टडी इन द नेक्स्ट पार्ट आई एम भूमिका सैनी आई हैव डन माई इंजीनियरिंग फ्रॉम एन आई टी जयपुर यू कैन फॉलो मी ऑन अन अकेडमी बाई फॉलोइंग दिस लिंक अन अकेडमी कोर्सेज आर फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट बट इफ यू लाइक द कोर्स यू कैन पे एन ऑप्शनल फी बाई फॉलोइंग द कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट लिंक ऑन अन अकेडमी वेबसाइट so what is geological time scale now it is a system of chronological measurement that describes the timing and relationship between events that have occurred throughout earth's history now in short geological time scale it actually depicts the geological history of earth how earth has evolved over a period of time and how scientists have developed the scale they have developed the scale by studying rock layers and fossils worldwide and these fossils they help a lot in depicting the geological Uh, time scale and the method used is radioactive dating that helps in determining the absolute divisions in time scale you might have heard of carbon dating that's the same method that is used for determining the divisions in the time scale now you know as we uh, divide a year into months months into weeks and weeks into days similarly the geological time scale is divided into eon eon is divided into era era is divided into periods and period is further divided into epochs so the largest one is eon and the smallest one is epoch okay now what are the different applications of geological time scale first is it illustrates the vast diversity of life that has been present on earth over time like when did dinosaurs came on earth when they became extinct and why they became extinct so all this uh, we'll study uh, later in when we'll study geological time scale in detail and it also summarizes how scientists study environment uh, earth's past environment and diverse life forms by examining different types of fossils so as i told you earlier that fossils and the radioactive dating method is used for knowing uh, or studying the diverse life forms which were present on earth earlier for example when fish came on earth and how it has evolved over a period of time so that is depicted on geological time scale it also explains how earth's history has been influenced by catastrophic event that has affected the conditions on earth and diversity of its life form so we'll be studying about all these in detail now the divisions of geological time scale see as i've told you that the largest one is eon and the smallest one is epoch so you can see it here there are two main eons one is pre cambrian eon and the second one is phanerozoic eon right now 88% of earth's history is is there in the pre-cambrian eon and the remaining we study in the phanerozoic eon and this phanerozoic eon is further divided into three eras that is cenozoic mesozoic and paleozoic okay now these three will be studying in detail that is cenozoic mesozoic and paleozoic okay and then you can see these are the eras this phanerozoic was the eon then it it is further divided into three eras that is cenozoic mesozoic and um paleozoic and these eras are further divided into periods periods are further divided into epoch so if you want to see we are currently in this holocene epoch which is actually a part of quaternary period and this period is a part of cenozoic era and cenozoic era is a part of phanerozoic eon i hope you are understanding it now so a uh, geological time scale it begins with pre cambrian eon right and as as i told you that 88% of earth's history is there in pre cambrian eon then i told you that the second eon is this one phanerozoic eon right and it is divided into three eras so if you see it here this uh, uh, the the three eras in which phanerozoic eon is divided one is paleozoic now paleo means ancient life so uh, 545 million years ago it started and it lasted somewhere around 300 million years the second one is mesozoic Uh, era now mesozoic it means middle life so it started roughly around 245 million years ago and lasted uh, 180 million years then the third one is cenozoic uh, era and it means recent life so currently we are in cenozoic era and uh, this is 65 million years ago continues uh, till the present day and today we are in the holocene epoch of quaternary period of cenozoic era you can see it again here we are in the this one we are in the holocene epoch of quaternary period this one is the quaternary period and this is of cenozoic era and cenozoic era is of phanerozoic eon okay 
so see this is how a uh, geological time scale helps in in knowing what happened on earth and when did it happen right and how it has evolved the life form on earth so you can see it here earliest fossil recorded of life somewhere in the pre cambrian eon then you can see it here first fish first land plants first amphibians first reptiles so these actually occurred in these periods for example uh, first dinosaurs it uh, it actually occurred in triassic period now triassic period is a part of mesozoic era similarly you can see it here during the cretaceous period or somewhere just at the start of this uh, paleocene epoch these dinosaurs they became extinct now we'll study uh, in the next uh, part of this geological time scale that what happened that these became extinct right then in the eocene uh, epoch this formation of himalayas it started right and this ice age it begins in the pleistocene uh, epoch and this epoch is a part of quaternary period and this period is a part of cenozoic era and cenozoic era is a part of phanerozoic eon so this is how geological time scale it helps us in knowing about what had happened on earth it actually helps us in knowing about the evolution of earth right so uh, definitely it helps a lot in understanding the concepts related to origin and evolution of earth okay so we'll uh, study this in detail that is what happened in cenozoic era what happened in paleozoic the different periods and actually when this flora and fauna and how it has evolved over the period of time so this we'll discuss in the next lesson thank you have a nice day hello everyone this is uh, part 2 of geological time scale in this we'll discuss about the details of geological time scale the different periods and epochs i am bhumika saini i have done my engineering from nit jaipur you can follow me on anacademy by following this link an academy courses are free of cost but if you like the course you can pay an optional fee by following the contribute link on an academy website so this we have already discussed that what is geological time scale i have told you that uh, it depicts the earth's geological history and in a chronological uh, arrangement and scientists have developed this scale by studying the rock layers that is the sedimentary rock layers and the fossil fuels now the process used is radioactive carbon dating it helps in determining the absolute divisions in the time scale and this also we had discussed that eon is for the divided into era era is for the divided into period and period into epochs so this is the division of geological time scale now this is what we have to discuss today that is uh, pre cambrian eon and phanerozoic eon which this particular phanerozoic eon is for the divided into three eras that is paleozoic mesozoic and cenozoic so that we'll be discussing today so let's discuss the pre cambrian now it started in 7 uh, started 700 million years before the present day and earth changed here from gaseous to liquid state why because earth was gradually cooling and that's why it was changing its state from gaseous to liquid here marine grasses evolved remember it's marine grasses and soft bodied invertebrate animals it evolved in warm sea not on land because land was still devoid of animals so this is about pre cambrian right and then we'll discuss about paleozoic era so first i have told you the pre cambrian one then in the phanerozoic eon we are discussing this one paleozoic okay now in paleozoic here the cambrian period is the first period of paleozoic era you can see it here this is the cambrian period and this is the paleozoic era now the paleozoic the word means ancient life and it was during this phase that explosion of life in oceans began and most of the continents here were covered with warm and shallow seas so invertebrate invertebrates which originated during the uh, uh, pre cambrian uh, era it actually it uh, invertebrates were dominating during the paleozoic era and fish it emerged first time during the paleozoic era and gradually the evolved uh, the, the fish it led to the arrival of amphibians that's why the end of paleozoic era is also known as age of amphibians because during this uh, period the amphibians were dominating and as far as the land uh, as far as the plants are concerned uh, it includes mosses ferns and cone bearing plants remember flowering plants had not evolved during this time also the co uh, the early coal forming forests were formed during this particular paleozoic era so these are the early fish that was prevailing during the uh, paleozoic era uh, these fish did not have any jaws as far as the land plants are concerned i have told you mosses ferns so these were not flowering plants that uh, that prevailed during the paleozoic era now it is said that at the end of this era mass extinction 
it took place and the probable reasons for the mass extinction it includes lowering of sea levels it might have been due to the formation of pangaea and um, it happened because of the because the continents were rejoined as pangaea and it might have led to lowering of sea level that might have led to mass extinction secondly the increased volcanic activity may also be one of the probable reason for mass extinction the last one is climatic changes so these three events might have led to mass extinction at the end of paleozoic era now the second one that is mesozoic era it means middle life so at the beginning of this era pangaea got Uh, formed right and it was in this mesozoic era only when the pangaea was formed and it broke during this period only so pangaea broke up around the middle of the era and here reptiles were dominant so reptiles were the most abundant animals why because of their ability to adapt to the drier climate prevailing during the mesozoic era and this was because their skin can maintain body fluids and their embryos live in shells so these are just the adaptations to acclimatize to dry climatic conditions of mesozoic era now uh, here dinosaurs were very active these dinosaurs they appeared first in the triassic period now triassic period is a period in the mesozoic era and here larger and more abundant dinosaurs they appeared in the jurassic period and apart from dinosaurs small mammals and birds were also prevailing and uh, especially their characteristics they helped them survive in the changing climatic conditions because these were small they were warm blooded animals and that could uh, help them in uh, acclimatizing to the changing environment so these were the mesozoic uh, animals dinosaurs uh, reptiles were there right these are the mesozoic mammals etc now uh, as far as the plant life is concerned here the main plant life of this time were gymnosperms or plants that produce seeds but no flowers so pine trees were prevailing uh, during most of the mesozoic era although at the end of this era flowering plants first appeared so it was at the end of mesozoic era when the flowering plants first appeared and this mesozoic era is also said to have ended with a mass extinction event as we have done in uh, the paleozoic era this mass extinction it took place roughly about 65 million years ago and that's when the most of the dinosaurs it actually disappeared and it became extinct now the reason for this uh, mass extinction it is said that many scientists they say that uh, a comet or an asteroid might have collided with earth and that might have led to uh the mass extinction so a, colli- uh, a comet or a meteoroid that might have collided with earth and it might have led to mass extinction so this asteroid or comet it might have collided with earth it might have led to huge cloud of smoke and dust it might have blocked the sunlight plants might have died then animals that eat plants might have died animals that eat plant eaters might have died so this is how the mass extinction at the end of mesozoic era took place now the last one is the cenozoic era that is the recent life now this begins roughly around 70 uh, 65 million years ago and it continues even today so we are currently living in this era and here the climate was warm and more, uh, mild marine animals such as whales dolphins they started evolving in this cenozoic era and um, mammals especially they began to increase and evolve adaptations uh, that allowed them to live in different climatic conditions on land air and sea so grasses it increased and it provided a food source for grazing animals and that's how the whole food chain it evolved uh, apart from this many mountain ranges were formed during this cenozoic era for example alps in europe himalayas in india rocky mountains in usa and these mountain the growth of these mountains might have helped to cool down the climate and it is said that ice age it occurred late in the cenozoic uh, era there is a period within the cenozoic era that is the quaternary period so it is said that in this period ice ages might have occurred and gradually the the climate changed the animals they started adapting to the changing climatic condition and this was the era which is known as the age of mammals because mammals were the most dominant during this particular era now as far as the fauna and flora is concerned flowering plants were now the most common plant life and as far the fa- uh, as far as the fauna is concerned algae uh, mollusks fish mammals and land animals like bats dogs cattle especially humans they are thought to have appeared roughly around 3.5 million years ago that is during the quaternary period in the cenozoic era okay so these are the animals during this period now this is just the gist of what i have uh, explained 
earlier like uh, you can see it here first fish it appeared during the paleozoic period then dinosaurs they are appearing during the mesozoic period then at the end of this they will actually there will be extinction of dinosaur then uh, in in this uh, uh, cenozoic uh, period formation of Himalayas is taking place. I told you a number of mountain ranges they formed during Cenozoic uh, period. Then Ice Age, I told you during the Quaternary period of Cenozoic era, Ice Age it begins, right? And it was during this Quaternary period when the humans they started, they actually came on the earth and they started evolving. And currently we are in this particular epoch. The name is Holocene epoch in the Quaternary period of Cenozoic era, and the eon is Phanerozoic. Okay. So this we have already discussed about the flora and fauna of Cenozoic, Mesozoic and Paleozoic era. Thank you. Hello everyone. Today we will discuss about continental drift theory. I am Bhumika Saini. I have done my engineering from NIT Jaipur. You can follow me on Unacademy by following this link. Unacademy courses are free of cost, but if you like the course, you can pay an optional fee by following the contribute link on Unacademy website. So before understanding continental drift theory, let me tell you one thing that plate tectonics theory, this is the most logical and scientific theory to explain the evolution of earth and the different phenomena taking place on earth, for example, volcanism, earthquake and uh, tsunami and uh, mountain building etc but before this theory a number of scholars have given uh, different theories like continental drift theory was given by alfred wegener then seafloor spreading theory then we'll discuss about geomagnetism after studying this we'll be in a better position to understand plate tectonics theory so let's start with continental drift theory now this theory uh, alfred wegener had uh, written a book known as origin of continents and oceans in 1912 and in this he had explained about his theory so the basic premises of this theory is one is supercontinent existed that is the name was pangaea and it it was uh, present near the it, it actually it existed near the present durban now this pangaea was surrounded by a huge water body that is panthalasa so you can see it here this was pangaea that is the supercontinent and it was surrounded by a huge water body that is panthalasa then Sial was floating over Sima. Now Sial is silica and aluminium and Sima is silica and magnesium. So Sial represents the continental crust and Sima the oceanic crust. Then the northern part of uh, Pangaea was known as Laurentia and the southern part was known as Gondwana land. So you can see it here. This one is Laurentia. This one is Gondwana land. And if you closely uh, see this one, this is India. And India was actually a part of Gondwana land. Then Pangaea was divided by a shallow and meandering water body known as Tethys Sea. So this one is Tethys Sea. That is the intervening space or intervening water body between Laurentia and Kondwana. Now this whole continental drift theory can be studied in five phases. In first phase, the Pangaea stage, that is the Pangaea was formed during Carboniferous period. Then in the second uh, phase, flight of continent took place. That is the continents, they began to drift and break in pieces. That is the two pieces. The northern one was named as Laurentia and the southern was, was, uh, one was named as Gondwana. So this is the first phase, that is Pangaea stage, uh, stage. This is the second stage, that is the uh, flight of continents. Here the northern part, uh, Laurentia and the southern part, Gondwana land. Then opening of Tethys. Now the intervening space between Laurentia and Gondwana, it was filled with Tethys Sea and it gradually got widened. So you can see it here, this Tethys Sea, this one is the Tethys Sea. Now it is gradually opening up. Okay. Now in the, third, uh, in the fourth stage, westward drift of continents took place. That is uh, specifically North and South America. They drifted westward and it led to opening of Atlantic Ocean. So this one is... This one is the opening of Atlantic Ocean. So the South America is drifted westward and North America is drifting westwards. Okay. Now the last stage that is orogenetic stage. In this phase the Rockies and Andes mountains were formed. So this is these are the different phases of uh, continental rift theory. Now the forces responsible for the movement that is the northward shift and the westward shift of continents. So for the northward shift Wegener has mentioned that the difference between the force of buoyancy and gravitational pull was responsible for northward movement and for the westward shift of North America and South America the tidal force of sun and moon was responsible for driving these uh, North American and South American continents in the westward direction. Now uh, in order to support the arguments 
Wegner has given a number of evidences like biological evidence, fossil fuel evidence, geological evidence, jigsaw fit and paleoclimatic evidence. So we uh, study each now. Now biological evidence says that lemmings, these are birds, they have the tendency to migrate westwards in search of land. But these creatures, they had no idea that the land has shifted westwards. Now this is uh, is actually the North America has shifted westwards and these lemmings, they were, they were found in Europe. So these creatures did not have any idea that land, that is the North America, shifted westwards and actually the sea awaits for their mass suicide. So this was the biological evidence put forth by Wegener. Now the next one is the continents, they fit together like puzzle pieces. So you can see it here, Europe, North America... South America, these all are fit together like puzzle pieces. You can see it here. All these are part of Gondwana land like South America, in uh, Africa, Antarctica, India, Australia. So all these continents fit together like puzzle pieces. So that, uh, uh, so as per this, Wegener has concluded that all these continents were once combined together in the form of supercontinent that is Pangaea. Now, uh, as far as this fossil evidence is, con uh, is concerned, he has mentioned that same fossils were found in different continents. For example, the fossils of Mesozoars, they were found in the southern part of South America and in Africa. The fossil of Glossopteris, it was found in South America, Africa, India, Antarctica and Australia. So, as per this, he, say, he's, he has concluded that uh, since same fossil is found on different continents, then that means that all these continents were once combined. That is the reason that these continents are, uh, sorry, the, the fossils are found in the, uh, same fossils are found in different continents. Now the next evidence is geological evidence. Now the, as per this, uh, it has been found that same types of rocks containing identical mineral content has been found on the eastern coast of North America, that is the Appalachian Mountains, and on the western coast of uh, Europe, that is the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern US and the Caledonian Mountains in the British Isles, they have similar uh, mineral content, that is identical rocks have been found. And as per this, Wegener has concluded that these, uh, these mountains were once forming a continuous range and this was because North America and Europe were once combined. Now, another evidence is glacial scars or glacial striations. Now, what happens whenever the glacier moves, it leaves these scars uh, on the rocks on which it moves. So, such uh, similar uh, scars have been found in different continents. For example, South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, India. So, this has uh, uh, actually made Wegener to conclude that all these uh, continents were once a part of supercontinent that is Pangaea, supporting the continental drift theory. So we have discussed about biological evidence, fossil evidence, geological evidence, jigsaw fit, paleoclimatic clim climatic evidence. So this was about continental drift theory. We will study the other theories in the next lessons. Thank you. Have a nice day. Hello everyone. In this lesson, we will be discussing about interior of earth, the different layers of earth and how the stratification is done. I am Bhumika Saini. I have done my engineering from NIT Jaipur. You can follow me on Unacademy by following this link. Unacademy courses are free of cost, but if you like the course, you can pay an optional fee by following the contribute link on Unacademy website. So let's study about interior of earth. Now, the configuration of surface of earth is largely a product of different processes which are operating in the interior of earth. And this actually it's due to the an, a number of exogenic as well as endogenic process. Now these are currently shaping the landscape of earth and uh, why we need to understand the interior of earth. Now understanding the interior of earth is essential to understand the nature of changes that takes place over and below the earth's surface. Now over means for example the phenomena like volcanism, earthquake etc. Now these are directly related to what is happening in the interior of earth. Now to understand the internal structure of various solar system objects because uh, earth is also a part of solar system and uh, all the uh, solar, subject, solar system objects have, uh, uh, have formed in the similar way. So it helps us, uh, us in understanding the internal structure of various solar system objects. Now to understand the evolution and present composition of atmosphere that is also linked to the interior, interior of earth. So uh, definitely interior of earth uh, helps us in understanding the evolution and present composition of atmosphere and in future deep sea mineral exploration. So in order to understand these, we need to understand the interior of earth. 
now what are the sources to study earth's interior now there are two uh, sources one is direct source and the other one is indirect source now direct source it includes mining and drilling volcanic eruption etc and indirect source it includes temperature and pressure variant variation as we go inside the earth how the temperature is varying and how the pressure is varying now the meteors they are also an indirect uh, source to study earth's interior because as i told you meteors asteroids these are all sol uh, solar uh, system objects and uh, by understanding their uh, composition or how they have fo formed we can also understand the earth's interior now the uh, third indirect way is seismicity so this we'll be studying uh, separately in detail in a in a different lesson so all these direct and indirect source they help in studying the earth's interior now earth let's let's come on directly to the earth's interior earth's layers these are identified by studying various direct and indirect source that i have already told you now the structure of earth's interior is made up of several concentric layers now you can see it here there are several concentric layers right you can see all these now as such broadly earth uh, interior of earth can be divided into crust mantle and core and further the crust then mantle is divided into upper mantle lower mantle in fact crust also can be divided into oceanic crust and continental crust then we have outer core inner core and in between each we have uh, seismic discontinuities that we'll study later in this lesson so these are the different layers of earth that is in the form of concentric circles okay so let's study each now each uh, earth's layer that is the crust now crust is the outer thin layer with a total thickness uh, ranging roughly between 30 to 50 km now this thickness of the crust may vary under the oceanic and continental areas so generally if you see oceanic crust is thinner roughly around 5 to 30 km thick and uh, on the contrary this continental crust is a bit thicker uh, it's 50 to 70 km thick and in fact this continental crust it may vary in different areas for example it is thicker in the areas of mountain systems uh, for example it is as much as 70 to 100 km in himalayan region and this whole crust it forms roughly around 1% of earth's volume now morovic or we can say moho discontinuity it forms the boundary between crust and asthenosphere now i told you that between each of them like between crust and upper mantle between upper mantle and lower mantle between man, uh, lower mantle and outer core and between outer core and inner core there are different uh, discontinuities that we will study later so the first one is moho discontinuity that is between crust and the asthenosphere now asthenosphere is actually a part of mantle so uh, the continents here are composed of sial or we can say uh, this is the, the crust can be divided into two parts that is the continental crust and oceanic crust now uh, continental crust is made up of sial that is silica and aluminum and oceanic crust uh, they are made up of heavier silicates that is silica and magnesium so this is also known as sema now uh, let's come on to the mantle that is the second layer now mantle extends from moho discontinuity to a depth of 2900 km so after moho discontinuity mantle starts and the depth is still 2900 km beyond which core starts right now the crust and uppermost part of mantle this is known as lithosphere so the crust plus the upper mo uppermost part of mantle is known as lithosphere and the thickness may range from 10 to 200 km and uh, lower mantle it extends beyond the asthenosphere now this one is in solid state and the density of mantle may vary between 2.9 to 3.3 and it may range from uh, 3.3 to 5.7 in the lower part so as we are go going down in the interior part of earth the density is generally increasing and uh, this mantle is forming 83% of the earth's volume okay now as i told you asthenosphere this is actually a part of mantle only so the upper portion of mantle is called asthenosphere now astheno means weak right and it is considered to be extending up to 400 km so remember from moho discontinuity till 2900 km mantle extends now the upper part, uh, portion of mantle is known as asthenosphere now asthenosphere it, it extends up to 400 km and this is the place from where the magma comes out from Uh, magma comes out uh, during this volcanic eruption so it is the main source of magma that finds its way to the surface during volcanic eruptions okay and it is a higher density than crust as i have told you as we are moving inside uh, from the crust to the core the density is increasing okay 
now the last one that is core so between 2900 kilometer to 6400 kilometer that is uh, this there lies this core now it accounts for 16% of earth's volume and it has the heaviest mineral materials of the highest density i told you uh density is increasing as we are moving towards the core and this particular core is composed of nickel and iron as i told you that continental crust is made up of sial oceanic crust is made up of sima mantle uh, especially the upper mantle is the area where from where magma is coming then this core it is made up of nickel and iron the outer core remember it is liquid but the inner core is solid remember the inner core is solid because of the increasing pressure downwards okay now let's study about the different discontinuities so just see this diagram in the first one that is conorot discontinuity it uh, it is it, it's lying between the upper and the lower crust so the upper part of crust and the lower part of crust there is this conorot discontinuity then between the crust and the upper mantle we have the moho discontinuity between the lower crust and upper mantle then between the upper mantle and the lower mantle we have repeated discontinuity then between the out, uh, uh, the lower mantle and the outer core we have gutenberg discontinuity then between the outer core and inner core we have lehman discontinuity so these are the different uh, discontinuities in between the different layers that is the upper crust and lower crust upper mantle and crust upper mantle and lower mantle then between uh, lower mantle and outer core and between outer core and inner core so this is all about the uh, different layers of uh, different layers in the interior of earth uh now this is one last topic that is earth's chemical composition now you can see it here the red one shows the the composition present in the earth so oxygen is present in abundant that's in the interior of earth then silicon then aluminum then iron then calcium etc so these are the elements present in the interior of earth so this is all about the earth's interior the different layers we have studied uh, we have studied about core mantle atmosphere crust and the direct and indirect sources present uh, uh, in uh, indirect sources to study the earth's interior thank you have a nice day everyone in this lesson we'll be discussing about different types of rocks and the rock cycle i am bhumika saini i have done my engineering from nit jaipur you can follow me on anacademy by following this link anacademy courses are free of cost but if you like the course you can pay an optional fee by following the contribute link on anacademy website So let's study about rock cycle. Now what is rock cycle? It is a sequence of events that involves the formation, alteration, destruction and reformation of rocks and this is due to a number of natural process. These natural process we'll be studying later in the slides. Now the rock cycle it involves recognition of three main classes of rocks. And what are the these three main classes of rocks? The, these are one is sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock and igneous rock. so one form of rock gets converted into another form uh, another form of rock gets like sedimentary rocks can be converted into igneous igneous can be converted into metamorphic metamorphic can be converted into sedimentary and likewise right so before uh, studying the rock cycle in detail let us understand how these rocks are made okay so first of all atoms they are making up elements then elements they combine to form natural compounds and these natural compounds and elements they combine to form minerals minerals are the ones that are making up rocks so inside the rocks we have different types of minerals and that's what differentiate uh, these uh, uh, rocks right and rocks are making up the earth now let's study about the rock cycle so you can see it here the three types of rock which i uh, told you one is igneous the other one is sedimentary and the third one is metamorphic now through this rock cycle you can uh, easily understand that one type of rock can be altered into other type like igneous can be altered into sedimentary sedimentary into metamorphic sedimentary can also be directly converted into igneous igneous can also be directly converted into metamorphic like this okay so let's study it in detail now first we'll study about igneous rock now these rocks are the primary rocks they form from molten rock or magma that is erupted during the uh, volcanic eruption okay so you can see it here magma then it cools and solidifies and it crystallizes into igneous rock okay now how this igneous rock is converted into sedimentary or how this uh, uh, igneous rock is converted into metamorphic or we can say that how sedimentary rock is converted into igneous and how metamorphic rock is converted into uh, igneous rock so we'll study it now now see becoming an igneous rock so how 
an existing rock whether it is igneous or metamorphic or sedimentary if it is subjected to enough heat and pressure that may lead to its melting right so that will form mold uh, this magma that is molten rock is called magma and when this magma it cools it solidifies to become the primary rock that is igneous rock so the ones that comes out of volcanic eruption and if it cools and solidifies it is known as igneous rock but the kind of igneous rock will depend on what was melted whether it was igneous earlier or metamorphic or sedimentary and how it cooled what uh, like how much time it took to took for cooling now igneous rocks these are classified based on their mineral composition and texture i told you minerals are the uh, the mineral composition is the one that actually differentiate the different types of rocks now uh, igneous rocks the some of the examples include granite you might have heard of it basalt rhyolite uh, granodiorite pegmatite etc now let's study about sedimentary rock the second one that is see this one is the sedimentary rock now igneous rock uh, like granite can be physically weathered we'll be discussing uh, weathering separately in different lesson so it can uh, igneous rock after weathering it leads to formation of clay and sand now what happens these sediments of clay and sand they are transported deposit deposited you can see it erosion then transportation then deposition right and then finally it actually compacts and it is lithified to form sedimentary rocks for example clay can become shale that is a sedimentary rock sand can become sandstone that is again a sedimentary rock right so from igneous rock how sedimentary rocks can be formed now let's study about how from metamorphic rocks uh, uh this um, igneous rocks are formed so the process is similar like metamorphic rock like gneiss can be physically weathered again to produce clay and sand now this clay again will become sedimentary rock like shale sand will turn into sandstone after compaction and lithification now one form of sedimentary rock can also be changed into another form of sedimentary rock for example sedimentary rocks can be physically weathered to produce sediments that can become other sedimentary rocks now uh, the example is like chemical weathering it dissolves the mineral in rocks uh, we'll be discussing chemical weathering uh, in the weathering lesson the, re the resulting dissolved compounds it forms evaporites like rock salt or rock gypsum these are also sedimentary rocks so one form of sedimentary rock is getting converted into other form of sedimentary rock okay now these are the example of sedimentary rock like sandstone shale limestone dolomite rock salt rock gypsum etc now let's study about metamorphic rock now if the igneous rock like basalt is exposed to sufficient heat and pressure it is transformed into metamorphic rock and it is called as metabasalt that is a metamorphic rock now metamorphism means change of form now that the, the change of form either from igneous to metamorphic or from sedimentary to metamorphic it takes place when the rock is subjected to sufficient heat and pressure okay now becoming a metamorphic rock from a sedimentary rock now if the sedimentary rock like limestone dolomite it it is metamorphs metamorphs means change of form it can become metamorphic rock like marble now marble is a metamorphic rock if the sedimentary rock like sandstone it is metamorphs it can become metamorphic rock like quartzite similarly uh, the sedimentary rock like shale gets converted into slate that is a metamorphic rock but remember the condition should be the rock should be subjected to intense heat and pressure now one form of metamorphic rock can also uh, lead to another form of metamorphic rock for example slate can get converted into phyllite phyllite can convert get converted uh, uh, provided it is subjected to intense heat and pressure into another metamorphic rock like schist then this one can get converted into gneiss so this is actually one form of uh, metamorphic rock can be converted into another metamorphic rock one form of igneous rock can be converted into metamorphic rock sedimentary rock can also be converted into metamorphic rock so now i hope it's clear to you see igneous rock it is formed after the uh, cooling and crystallization of magma igneous rocks are formed right now after the weathering erosion transportation deposition sediments are formed now after the lithification and compaction cementation and compaction of uh, sediments sedimentary rocks are formed now under intense heat and pressure if these sedimentary rocks are subjected to intense heat and pressure so what happens metamorphism or change of form takes place and that leads to formation of metamorphic rocks right and in fact igneous rocks can also be uh, uh, actually can change their form to metamorphic rocks sedimentary rocks can also directly change sedimentary rocks can directly form igneous rock so this is all about rock cycle and we have discussed about different types of rock like igneous rock i told you basalt granite rhyolite sedimentary rocks we have already discussed like sandstone limestone dolomite gypsum salt etc and uh, 
rock salt and metamorphic rocks like slate schist gneiss marble right quartzite these all are metamorphic rocks so this is all about rock cycle thank you have a nice day